Hello everyone, I'm Hafiz. And I'm Parkson. We are the fathers behind the podcast, We, We Are, are That's Too. We discuss everything from being an effective father to a good co-parent to our spouse. We also have guests and experts on our show to talk about the different aspects of fatherhood. Come and join us to discover more about our experiences as fathers because We Are That's Too. too. Click on the link below to follow us on Spotify. Today, my co-host Hafiz and I will be speaking with Martin Lim, who is a father of two kids, and he is the Chief Relationship Officer at the Focus on the Family. Now, he not only nurtures relationships with stakeholders, I'm told he's also... He also has green fingers because his hobby is gardening. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Welcome, Martin. <laughs> hi, 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 Martin. Hi, hi, show us some of your plants that you have at home. <laughs> okay. I can't show you because the camera is <laughs> <can't> big. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. So we, yeah. we will trust you. Okay. We trust yeah. you. Yeah. All right. How are you doing today? Good, good. I just had lunch with my two kids. Yeah. It's because, uh, oh, you know, this is phase two. We are all at home. Yeah, so it's uh, really a good time that, you know, we can spend time together. And as mm -hmm. interestingly, my my son is, you know, getting a bit agitated. Once wants to go and swim, I say, better not. And, you know, because he needs to go and exercise. But my daughter says, you can actually talk to me because you can exercise your mouth. So, <laughs> I, you know how, how the, the boys and the girls are different, right? In that sense, you know, as we were you know, talking about this, this area. So I was like, wow, remembering about, you know, how girls can really, really engage and talk while boys need to go and exercise, you know? <laughs> mm, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. They, 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 they believe that action speaks louder than words, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's great also that uh, you raise that up because there's a very topic that we're going to discuss today, raising uh, boys and girls. That's right. That's, that's right. right. Sons and daughters. And so sons it, and daughters, it's yeah. very nice that you have a son and a daughter. So I think uh, we will be able to have a very interesting conversation today. Uh, yeah. Tapping back to your experience about raising a boy and a girl and how different it can be. Uh, mm. You know, in the past, sons mm. were preferred over daughters. I, I don't know if you remember those days. I think we probably missed it. Um, mm. Because sons can carry on the family name and sons can help at home as well as earn an income to support the family. Right. But today, uh, I, I think we all agree, right? That has changed. Um, mm. When you ask expecting couples, you know, would you prefer to have a boy or a girl? They would say, well, either mm. one as long as they're healthy. <laughs> yeah. Happy and healthy, you know, they're not the yeah. difficult child. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Do, do you think that... Um, Even in spite of that, do you think there are stereotypes when it comes to how boys and girls should be raised? Mm. Well, I guess that there is, you know, such stereotypes because I think boys being boys, they're active, you know, and girls being usually the gentler ones. Um, and I think if you look at, you know, sometimes in terms of the, you know, the kids when they receive uh, gifts, you know, presents. You know, boys usually, you know, you will get all the toy balls and cars, whereas girls, you get all the dolls and all this. So I guess, you know, even the colors, you know, even, you know, you've asked, you know, whether is it a boy or a girl, you know, buy a baby gift, right? You know, girls, you get a pink, and then boys, you choose the color blue and all this. So all this, yeah. I, I guess it is all inherent, you know, in, in uh, so-called stereotypes, you know, as to how you know, we raise our, our kids. Because I think biologically, you know, I need, anyway, male and female, they are different, right? You know, males right. being physically more active, having an upper body strength. And then, whereas females, you have the, the capacity to bear children. And I guess, given all these differences, right, I think uh, society has different expectations as well, you know, in terms mm. of male and female. And it's natural for parents to interact with, you know, the boys and girls differently, right? Um, I think mm -hmm. boys, you know, in general also have advanced spatial skills, you know, while girls having more advanced verbal, uh, you know, that, that social skills. You know, this morning as, uh, as, I was, as I talked in Facebook, Facebook reminded me, you know, today 
about 10 years ago, my daughter called Papa Papa. And that was, she was wow. only like six, seven months old, you know. You know, okay. how early, you know. <laughs> so you talk about girls being very, having that verbal uh, skills, right? And, and, and you see it. And, and I remember my son, when he was uh, just a few months where he started uh, able to roll around, you know, there was a, a time we, we couldn't find him, you know, in our house. We were looking high and low. Was it because where he was you were small built? <laughs> no, but after about a good th- five, ten minutes, we finally found him under our bed. <laughs> okay. he, was, he rolled himself all the way, you know, under underneath the bed. So so you can see some some of these things that, you know, where we talk about mm. boys being very active, sometimes it, it just shows even very young age, you know. You know, be it a verbal, be it a, a very action-packed, you know, that kind of thing. I think sometimes it, it just shows, you know, in, in all these areas. So I, I guess why parents sometimes, you know, uh, if you talk about those stereotyping, uh, there's some truth in it. Yeah. Mm. No, but I was talking more about uh, how boys and girls should be raised differently. I mean, just now you, you actually, mm. you know, uh, just demonstrated or, or showed us a... An example of a stereotype you say girls are you know generally more gentle uh yeah. <laughs> i don't think yeah. that's true <laughs> a lot of the times you know girls can be quite you know aggressive uh yeah. they, they're aggressive in a passive way maybe <laughs> but they're still aggressive right. Right. yeah um so in terms of upbringing i know how how boys should be should be brought up you know for mm. example you know boys should be taught how to be tough for you know Mm. Uh, and girls taught how to be gentle and you know mm. very uh, things like that. Um, right. So yeah, those were the kind of stereotypes I was thinking about, now. So do you mm. think those still exist? Well, I guess it it uh, in a way it, it does. Uh, I mean, so it it also brings about our upbringing, right? Uh, how how we are being brought up. So I I remember if uh, my family there are about you know four boys two girls and the way we i was being brought up is also like you know uh my dad owns a sort of like a cement product factory and every school holidays the boys were being just like go and go and work you know so we mm. were like doing all that rough kind of kind of work whereas the girls were actually my sisters were actually at home you know they don't go even school holidays right but they help out uh, but they were expected to help out in the in a kind of at uh, home. household chores you know uh, yeah, the domestic, it, 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 yeah, correct. And my, my grandmother expects that, you know, because uh, you know that the older generation. Um, so I anyway, when it comes to my, uh, you know, my kids, I think we do not have that. I mean, for 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 us, actually, in a way, we try and let both my son, my daughter, to, you know, if it's house work right everybody will chip in like, even this COVID right we all chip in to help la. I mean we don't carry that that kind of uh, mindset from the past right but rather we really expose both uh, in fact my son is the better cook you know she, she, his interest mm. is in the cooking and mm-hmm. so in fact this COVID he has been cooking for us so we are very, very thankful wow. you know, for, for <laughs> okay. to, to you know get, get steak whatever and then he just uh, you know uh, maybe enjoy uh, his, his his cooking. So yeah. so I guess yeah. In in a way, times have changed. I guess yeah. So definitely, uh, times have changed. Yeah, yeah. After so, you have four kids, yeah. so what was your experience of raising boys and girls also? Okay, yeah, I have four kids, two boys and two girls. Um, from my perspective, uh, there are advantages or disadvantages in a sense that uh, when you try to expose everything equal uh, to every kid, regardless of their gender, uh, mm. the advantage is they will grow up, I think, more resilient. Um, mm. I think out there, uh, when they are in school, when uh, they are uh, at work later, mm. uh, if you don't have a stereotype view of uh, what gender roles are, mm. when they talk, I think they have a better way to um, acknowledge a better relationship with others. Because I also heard that um, some boys uh, are being bullied because they look a bit infeminate. 
effeminate, meaning they may play not so much look effeminate, but do, they do effeminate things. What the society, for example, they like cooking, they may like dolls better, a soft toy better, and then they may be um, uh, categorized as you know, uh, you know, being girly. So I think at a very young age, if someone a, a, a boy, for example, is being accused as such, it may affect their self-concept and identity. Mm. And if they are not able to perceive their world as a broader world, um, then they may feel victimized. So my, mm. my children, um, although, again, I try my very best to not um, specify, you know, for example, uh, housework must be done by the girls only and uh, you know when for example uh, rough work done by the boys only but somehow naturally you know they mm. choose according to their biological strength right yeah, uh, yeah. more than uh, not unnatural because I can always push but I think mm. if I push too much it may go against their natural self for example if I were to tell uh, the girls you know mm. you should do the hard work mm. you know uh, I think it's okay to a certain extent, uh, but mm. physically they cannot take it uh, and assume that my girls, yeah, I have girls who have limitations. I'm not sure of other parents who have girls who are, you know, more, uh, much more stronger, but definitely the boys are stronger. Uh, mm. They carry weight you know, and so on. So I, I rather, you know, not have this uh, uh, stereotype. At the same time, I know the limitations based on the bio biology. And apparently I did a bit of research on... Um, children uh some study were done a long time ago um boys and girls mm -hmm. even before they mm -hmm. can be assigned gender roles or they and they they understand that they are girl or boy they tend mm -hmm. to choose naturally based on their uh, biological strength or biological makeup for mm -hmm. example apparently the boys even below 18 months old tend to choose the trucks the ball and uh, those physical mm -hmm and spatial based uh, toys hmm. you know but the girls will choose more uh, not to a larger extent than the boys but more of the girls will choose uh, than the boys more of them choose the uh, uh, relationship based uh, toys you hmm. know with dolls uh, more relationship based uh, that that let them play together rather than play, play by themselves so this hmm. is also research based that uh, i thought is interesting for us to to uh, have in mind as well right Mm. You know, I've been reading recently some articles. In fact, there are quite a number of these articles about, uh, you know, should you or would you allow your boy, let's say you have a new son, right? A newborn son. Uh, and then as he grows up, uh, would you allow him or would you even introduce uh, a doll, you know, uh, to him as a toy? Okay. Because this is something not, not done normally. Um, but what they are suggesting is that uh, these kind of toys that you know boys will play with actually develops a, a, a side of them that uh, has not been developed and that's the side of empathy and the nurturing side of it um, you know so unless as the as the child grows up as the boy grows up he has uh, baby cousins for example and nieces and nephews and he gets you know he gets a chance to take care of them and play with them you know and that that actually may uh, stir up that nurturing side of him, you know, and that prepares him for fatherhood to be a more involved father. Uh, but other than that, you know, um, a, a boy growing up might never have a lot of opportunities to do that. So when he becomes a father, it's like the first time holding a baby, you know, that, that, that was my case. <laughs> okay. Uh, so it was a very, it was a really a first time experience. Uh. So I think maybe along the way some preparation and some exposure and some experience will definitely come in handy hmm. yeah um i thought it's also interesting to for us ourselves that we have we have already uh, children boys and girls all of us that to put a boy in a certain box a girl in a certain box for example a boy doesn't like to talk a girl like to talk although by nature i think this has shown all right, uh, due to the uh, brain development and so on, or even mm. upbringing for that matter. Mm. Uh, these differences in personality sty styles do mm. make a difference uh, in terms of boys and girls. And there's a range. Not every boy don't like to talk, right? So there are boys who are, uh, you know, more talkative mm. and more socialized. So yeah. I think to put them in boxes as boys and girls and fix them on that mindset 
To me, that's mm. wrong. To me, that's wrong because there's the other aspect of development, which is uh, mental development and child development. Yeah. I think children will be what they are to main to a certain to a great extent of how they are brought up, not yeah. just what they are being uh, uh, in their nature. So I think the discussion about raising daughters and boys, uh, why I think this is very important to me at least, is for us to realize uh, at the end of the day we want our children to grow up. Uh, as wide and as broad in terms of skills mm. as possible, right? Uh, that means when they go out, go out to their back to their social environment, be it at school, uh, with their friends and at work, they're able to be more flexible in dealing with different kind of situation. And don't treat, for example, oh boys, they will be good engineers because engineers don't have to talk to people; they just talk to <laughs> numbers. You know, oh girls, they'll be good uh, in terms of uh, relationship people. But we have, for example, Martin, you are. Your job is a relationship manager. <laughs> so it, you basically, you know, go against all the stereotype there is. You know that you are a people person, uh, and yet you are a man, and you are the best person for the job. At least focus of a family, which is not a small organization, has recognized. You mm. see, so you probably have been brought up differently. Even you said that, for example, your 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 own father, you know, mm. you had that uh, maybe a patriarchal approach a bit. You, you mentioned about the cement factory. Yeah. But even now, you ask, I ask you today, if you have a cement factory, mm. would you do the same? Mm. <laughs> well, now it's all machinery. <laughs> <laughs> And AI. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good, yeah, good answer. Because I think today, uh, the work environment has changed. Mm. Right? Uh, it is more egalitarian. Uh, and uh, women has a greater opportunities. If not equal opportunities, they have greater opportunities than before. Uh, mm. Girls have almost equal opportunities at school, and we see that in mm. the academic performance. Uh, mm. Generally, correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe it's via uh, anecdotes, but I've seen uh, many data has shows that girls tend to be more well performing in academic uh, aspect. Mm. All right, and, and also depends how the ed education system is being set up. Right, mm. if the education system is set up to be more robust, physical. Uh, mm. less academic, you know, maybe mm -hmm. that is uh, advantageous for uh, the, the the boys. But I think the system today is very much mm -hmm. classroom-based, book-based, reading-based. Uh, mm -hmm. If it's not very active in nature, those boys who are used to more active, uh, what called motor skills, uh, uh, test and so on, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of other skills like verbal, uh, well, if it's, it's a more uh, in reading skills, Uh, is being tested, then they probably uh, will not get uh, start on the same platform. And I think there's a debate out there still, you know, uh, whether our education system is equal, you know, for the boys and the girls. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's a lot, a lot to think about. I want to switch tracks a little and um, talk a bit about the early years. Uh, there is this doctrine uh it's called the tender years doctrine i'm not sure if anyone has heard of it which says that you know the boys need their mothers during the early stages of their their lives okay like early childhood for example then at around a certain age and um this is probably around seven years old and onwards uh that's where the father will play a more significant role you know the, the child will need the father a bit more uh, but in the early years The mother is enough. Um, have you heard of this? Um, not not really, but I, I think it is natural, right? I think for if you think about it, because a mother, in a way, is the one that carries uh, the baby, you know, in her womb, right, till the baby is born. I think during the childbirth and breastfeeding, you know, I think the oxytocin that was being described as the love hormone is actually it causes the attachment between the mother and child, right? Mm. And I think not to mention the physical closeness, right? The mother breastfeeds the baby. And biologically, you know, uh, mothers are also designed to be more attached, to be able to sort of like better take care of infants, right? Uh, be it ah, boy, that, boy, is boy, that boy. a stereotype? Am I hearing a stereotype? <laughs> well, I, I think if you look at it, uh, that, that is how nature is being designed. I mean, For guys, we can't breastfeed our our babies, right? So this is this is how uh is being is being designed. But it doesn't negate the fact that fathers are not important, right? 
I think I remember. I, I mean, I remember that supporting my wife during the years, early years, when my my baby, when my daughter is still very young. And uh, and the thing is that you know when when my daughter is crying, right? When I picked her up, well, I sing her a song, you know, and then she she just comes down as well, you know, in that way. So so of course before. It was, she was in my wife's tummy. I was already singing, you know, to her the same song. And then interestingly, when she was born, and then you know, when I, I sing the same song, right? And she responds, mm. you know. So yeah, so, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's what they yeah. say. They, they can remember the voice, uh, although yeah. in the womb, the what uh, what the fetus hears is muffled, you know, because of right. the amniotic fluid and all that. Right. Yeah, but they 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 believe that the infant can actually recognize the voice, and that's why you know once the the child is born into this world, uh, right. they, they will gravitate towards the voice that is familiar to them. Yes. Correct. Yeah. Yes. So maybe, Parkson, you can uh, relate to us the doctrine. What does it say? And maybe later we can comment. Well, it, it's, it says uh, that boys need their mothers in the early stages and then only at about maybe just before they go to school, uh, around seven, six, seven years old, that's where the father is becomes an important figure, you know? Uh, which means, you know, important in the sense of uh, teaching the boys certain skills uh, and also being, you know, about masculinity and, and so on and so mm. forth. Yeah. So, I mean, as a uh, center for fathering, we, we want to challenge that thinking, you know, mm. and uh, in fact, uh, we have been advocating for paternity leave, which went from... Uh, just two days to two mm. weeks in 2017, you know. So that's a really a, a, a quantum leap in, <laughs> in that sense. Uh, mm. But two weeks is still not enough, you know. So uh, recently there were some talks about uh, uh, even suggestions that there should be maybe, you know, because maternity leave is four months, right? So fathers should get, you know, two to three months, for example. Um, so that, you mm. know, the father really establishes that bond uh, right. with the child and what, right. what studies have found is that when fathers are involved in the child's life in the early infancy stages uh, right. at least in the first 18 months or so then more likely he will be involved in the in the later part of the child's life that, that meaning about seven, six seven eight nine ten years old so mm. i think there's a lot of advantages la. so this kind mm. of um you know notions you know thinking that's going floating around um, maybe right. you have not heard that the the official label, which is tender years doctrine, but you have probably heard of that kind of thinking, you know. So fathers, uh, you just continue working while mothers will take care of the <laughs> take care of the <laughs> child. <laughs> Actually, you know, uh, Parkson, to add to your point, uh, focus. Uh, we did a survey last year uh, for a survey for moms, and the moms says that you know they do better when fathers are more involved. You know, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they are reported that they, you know, they reported lower stress. You know, and it's it's good. I mean, in terms of like supporting what you want to do, right? In terms of advocating the support for fathers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That, that's why uh, every child has two parents to start with. All right. So yeah. there must yeah. be a reason for that, and yeah. it may not be split fifty fifty, but it's at least uh, more equitable. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think Parkson uh, is a doctrine anyway. Uh, it's a doctrine based on certain assumptions, based on uh, uh, certain uh, facts, and then the doctrine is being made. But looking at different situations, even you mentioned it, all right? If uh, today we have uh, mothers who work as much, or go to uh, work outside as much as fathers do, and then we are limiting the development uh, opportunity that the child may have, if the father is to take a back seat, you know, in the first tender years. Uh, mm -hmm. Secondly, I think it's a perceptual perceptual mindset that uh, we have to, uh, you know, change, uh, especially among uh, men, among fathers, that they may have been brought up, like most of us, I suspect, um, from parents or from fathers or from parents who have uh, ascribed to more patriarchal mindset uh, of certain gender-based mindset, you know, uh, mm. that today cannot be um, cannot be practically applied because of the different situation. 
Mm. And uh, even if uh, Bakshan did mention, uh, all families uh, have fathers and mothers. Not all families have fathers and mothers. In fact, we have um, divorced families. We have uh, children who uh, in the early years probably did manage to have their father with them or their mother mm. with them. So the, the role has to be ass assumed by the single uh, parent. And I think this is the reality of today. There are many single yeah. parents out there. Uh, I think, Park Sen, you did also differentiate between single parent and divorced parent. Uh, these are the two different, right? Uh, because single parent may uh, not be divorced. Uh, mm. they, they, they be, for example, have their um, spouse uh, passed away uh, and so mm. on. But divorced parents may still have two parents. And usually mm. in our context, the mother, the one who has the uh, custody, custody over the child, and the role of the father... Um, is usually a minor, even minor, again, mm. because they can only see probably once a week, once in two weeks, and we have spoken to some of these fathers, and uh, they see that, although some people will say, oh, after divorce, then you realize that you must be a better father. But I think putting that mm. aside, uh, that awareness uh, in general uh, should be mm. made, uh, uh, the opportunity should be given to all fathers to have access to their kids, actually those who are more aware. Mm. and therefore be able to develop the children better uh, mm. and uh, not just, uh, you know, uh, the masculine side of it is being developed, you know, uh, but the non-masculine is not developed. Because I think, Pakistan, you may also want to talk about the rough and tumble play uh, that is necessary for all kids, not just boys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but before that, I want to just clarify i didn't say every family has a father and mother i said every child is it uh, was born uh, with a father and a mother so mm -hmm. how some some fathers and mothers succeed in staying together and some do not so that's up to the up to the father and mother what they do with their lives and their marriages mm -hmm. okay right. but the fact that every child is born with a father and a mother uh, mm -hmm. it tells us something that uh, both are have a very important, significant, maybe in, indispensable role in the child's life. So we have to figure it out what that role is, what those roles mm -hmm. are, and do our best to, to play them if we are really interested in the needs of the child and, right. and meeting all of them. Yeah. So, Pakistan, I don't know whether you've heard of this Chinese saying, uh, San Sui Ding Zhong Shen. Um, no? Okay, I feel my Chinese. <laughs> Three years. Yeah. You know, I did not feel my Chinese, but I don't know <laughs> Three years old, I mean, three years, right? Determines your uh -huh. life. So, so if you're talking about the early years, right? The From age zero to three is so important. So like you, you cannot negate a father's role because like what uh, the father's active involvement, how it actually has a significantly actually positive effect on the child's cognitive, you know, skills. Mm -hmm. You know, when you talk about rough and tumble play, it actually uniquely contributes to the early childhood development, right? By promoting more mm -hmm. risk-taking, etc. Problem-solving behavior. I think it impacts your later years. Yeah. Oh, that's absolutely true. Yeah. I think it works both ways, you know. I think um, uh, maybe one of the assumptions of this uh, tender age, tender years doctrine, you know, that fathers can come in and play a more active role later on, you know, in the child's life, uh, assumes that the, it is the child that needs the father. But have we ever considered the father needs the child? Right. Mm. Okay. Mm. So if the father just stands at the sideline and you know it's like in a mm. football match, you are the reserve, right? Substitute, and then you're only called to come into the field when you're needed. Um, mm. But in, in parenting, it's a relationship which takes time to build, and if you don't yeah. start it from the beginning, then you are kind of lagging behind, you know, yeah. and you have a lot of catching up to do. See, yeah. so that's why it's always advantageous to start from day one, uh, is to start building that relationship and getting to know the child and get letting the child know you right and the attachment is formed right from the beginning the bonding is there so that mm -hmm. when when a child is six seven years old and you want to begin to do something with the child and maybe you know teach the child impart certain skills um the relationship is already there to do it yeah right and what what many studies have found is also fathering benefits the father in terms of changing him changing yeah. his thinking, changing his personality, you know, and all that. Um, mm. So I think maybe they missed out this, this aspect of it that, you know, yeah, the child needs a father, but the father needs the child as well. Indeed, indeed. I think that that's a very powerful um, pers uh, perspective 
that uh, mm. the older person need the younger person uh, at times um, mm. and we're not just uh, the other way around because I'm also doing mentoring because in mentoring which especially is uh, about the same uh, role that a father play to a child ex uh, by sharing experience sharing mm. uh, I mean and giving advice and teaching these are some of the mentoring roles that mm. if a mentor an older person thinks that they are only giving to the younger person and give this mm. context to the child then the motivation is not as great if he looks at the relationship as something that he is benefiting as well mm. so if a father sees a relationship with the child as it makes him a better person mm. definitely it transforms the whole relationship to a more um, reciprocal uh, manner instead of just a one way mm. manner and, mm, and i yeah, think it's it, mutually beneficial yeah and and I, mm. i understand that very much uh to to be a very powerful uh perception that all fathers uh, should have uh, mm. that they are learning as well not just giving right yeah that's why there's a saying you know uh fathers are not perfect men but they are being perfected through fathering you <laughs> <laughs> saying is by pastor or by some other wise guru uh, no no not original by me <laughs> i can't remember the guy who said it and it and it's just a paraphrase i don't it's not a exact quote yeah. <laughs> and that becomes yours already yeah <laughs> okay, we read the no, no, to our children as well right yes yeah. yes definitely definitely so yeah. uh, if pastor, we maybe... if we allow ourselves to be taught Mm. Yeah, uh, following up from that uh, tender years doctrine, uh, so probably it's not where the development is coming from. What kind of development is needed by the child? So maybe you can outline, uh, regardless of whether the father or the mother uh, is the more uh, you know uh, active one at the different years. What skills and what kind of uh, thing that actually uh, are being built or developed in the child? Well. Uh, okay, for the early childhood, um, you know, in, in Singapore, all of us are thinking about the cognitive development, you know, because uh, it's, it's, it's a very competitive society, you know, and parents uh, want to prepare their children from as early as possible, you know, and many parents will not spare a dime, you know, signing mm. up their child to an enrichment class. And I've I read mm. somewhere in some article that, you know, as young as three years old, parents will sign up their child to some enrichment class, trying that, that so-called promises to develop them cognitively. I mean, you look at the infant formula industry alone, uh, Okay, mm. just because they put some words on the on the label of the can and says this is fortified by with this and this and this, you know, uh, it will improve your brain, your child's brain development. More well, parents will say, "Wow, this one I must mm. buy." <laughs> mm. Okay, but actually, yeah, um, you know, some experts have come out to say actually they're all the same. All right, don't believe all the publicity and marketing. Okay, they're all the same. All right. Um, And, and some parents even tell me, you know, it says, uh, wow, my child, uh, you know, talk back to me. I said, um, your fault, uh, you know, you, you, you gave your, your baby, you know, your child when he was a baby, such good infant formula, you know. So he's so smart now, he's able to talk back to you. <laughs> of course, that's a joke. <laughs> of course, you know, just a joke. Huh? Okay. Yeah, but most on a serious note, what, what are the things that um, needs to be developed during the early childhood days? Okay. It's something that we hardly talk about and mm. that is the executive functions okay have you heard mm. of the executive functions nope okay I know, executive uh, director like myself <laughs> 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 okay i mean the fact that you know for example like you are sitting down at at the at your table you know and your one of your kids is uh, doing homework next to you All right, so you're reading the newspapers and then your child asks you a question. Hey, how do I, how mm. do you do this? Uh? And then you have to put down your paper and switch channels and now you focus on your child, mm. right? And then after you have helped your child, you switch channels again and focus back on your newspaper. Now, that skill is part of executive functions, okay? It's called attention, all right, and focusing, all right? Okay, so uh, another Another uh, executive function is working memory, you know, being able to remember phone numbers when somebody tell you their phone number, okay, and then you just hold it in your mind until mm. you can find a pen and paper and you write it down, 
Okay, so that's called working memory. Working memory is also important when you're reading storybooks, for example. Okay, uh, after reading one, one page and then you move on to the next page, but you forgot what happened in, in the previous page, that means you, you're, you have very poor working memory. Okay, mm -hmm. another one is a very important one is called uh, impulse control. All right. And impulse control is about how do you delay gratification. Remember the experiment, the marshmallow test? Yeah. yeah. Where the child is put in a room by himself or herself with one marshmallow in front of him or her. And then the, the uh, experimenter tells the child, you know, I'm going to leave the room for 15 minutes. Okay. And when I come back and you have not eaten the marshmallow, I'll give you another one. It means you now have two. So they, they tested a, a bunch of kids and, and you know, saw... What, was seeing who, which, which child, uh, which of them ate the marshmallow and which of them did not. And then, not only that, they, they tracked these children for the next 20 years into their adulthood. And they found that those kids that did not eat the marshmallow, that means they were able to have delayed gratification. They were able to delay gratification. They were much more successful than the bunch of kids who ate the marshmallows. Okay, so executive functions is a foundation, all right, and it, it, it will determine a lot of things in the future, like your cognitive as well as social capabilities, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it will, it will help you in many, many areas. Like mm -hmm. today, you know, school going kids, what, what does parents complain about? Oh, my kids, mm -hmm. once they pick up the phone, they cannot put it down. Mm -hmm. So what, what possibly is, you know, the... Uh, weakness of these children. I think impulse control is one. Delay gratification is another. Uh, motivation, you can say. So different areas. So the early mm -hmm. childhood period is the time that you develop these skills. All right. Mm -hmm. If possible, by age five, because according to Harvard, uh, is they say that the child's brain is 90% developed. Mm -hmm. All right. By age five. Right. Okay. So right. those are things that uh, parents, many parents, including myself, um, mm. are not aware of. And so we, we kind of uh, go on a cruise mode, you know, for many years until mm. the child is about to enter school and then parents start to say, oh, maybe I need to send my kids for phonics lessons or certain lessons, you know, so that it prepares the child for school, you see. And then the, mm. that whole period of time, maybe three to four years, very little is done. They just park the kids with some childcare mm. center, you know, and whatever the mm. childcare center does, that's it. Uh, so no intentional focus on this area of executive functions. So, for example, mm. impulse control. If a child is weak in impulse control, later on, the, mm. the behavior of this child will look very, very similar to someone with ADHD. Mm. Okay. Um, so does this mm. child have ADHD? Possibly. So if you mm. send this child for some assessment, they, the test might come out to reflect that this child has some degree mm. of ADHD. So mm. is ADHD purely genetic? People believe that it's not. Okay, it's mm. also nurturing. Uh, how mm. this child was nurtured? What are the how well his skills mm. were developed? You know, and if it's not well developed, then he will suffer. And uh, we have a term for it now. It's called ADHD. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a very important uh, um, information there. Um, those are skills that we need to teach, regardless of the gender of the kid, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So, and now we are talking about dads here. All right. Mm -hmm. What will be the um, kill skills uh, that dads mm -hmm. uh, can better, um, you know, impart to their children uh, as a boy and as a girl? Right, because I think that um, that is also uh, what we want to understand. If a child doesn't have a father, uh, although the mother can take over some of the father's role, but uniquely fathers do have a specific role, and they can do uh, they have the potential to do better and naturally. So, what what will that be? Hmm. Um, there there isn't a distribution of labor in that sense, you know, okay, you know, mothers teach these skills and then fathers teach another set of skills. Um, they, they teach basically the same set of skills, but in a different way, all right, and maybe slightly mm -hmm. focused on, on some rather than the others. Take, for example, fathers and mothers play with their kids, but they play differently. So rough and tumble, for example, 
So rough and tumble play actually is beneficial for the children because it teaches the children, you know, um, social skills, you know, uh, communication skills. It teaches the child about uh, um, what's that word? Mm -hmm. uh, Self emotional regulation. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, because when you play rough and tumble, you're you're all excited, right? But then there comes a time where you have to calm down you know, take a shower, get ready for dinner. So you need to learn how to calm down. That's emotional regulation. Uh, so mothers don't, don't often play rough and tumble. So the child doesn't get to develop that, those specific skills, you see. But when fathers play rough and tumble with the kids, which is very normal for fathers to do, then the child gets to develop those skills, you see. And, and when it comes to impulse control, for example, you know, impulse control, focus, attention, um, you know, we talk about one of the ways is like uh, setting boundaries, you know, setting boundaries, you know, giving time limits, you know, and things like that. Now, in, in the book, The Boy Crisis, written by, well, I can't remember his name right now. <laughs> okay. Um, what, what he's realized, what, through his observation and studies, what he has come to mm. realize is that mothers are uh, law givers, okay? They will, they will give the law, you know, all right? Mm. But when it comes to enforcing the law, it is the fathers that enforce the law. Or they are more effective. Fathers are more effective when it comes to enforcing the law. I, I've talked mm. to so many fathers, you know. The mothers will tell the children, you know, okay, in five minutes, mm. go and go to bed, you know. But nobody listens. Nobody does. <laughs> in five minutes' mm. time, nobody moves. Everybody is still sitting there doing, you know. And then, but once the, once the father stands up and say, <clears throat> Everybody runs, <laughs> you know. Um, so it, what he's found is, yeah, you know. So when it, that's why both of them have to work as a team, all right. And mm. a child, needs, I, in the ideal situation, the the child needs both the father and the mother to get the complete um, training, so to speak. Mm. Yeah, the book actually you mentioned the book crisis is uh, by Warren Farrell. Uh, yes. And interestingly, is a co-authored by John Gray, who is the author of Men from, uh, from Mars, Women are from Venus. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so I think just picking mm. up from uh, the part on tumble, uh, rough and tumble play, right? Um, I think one of the skills that uh, are thought uh, indirectly when you, you, rough at, you use rough and tumble play with the children is for the child to understand between aggressiveness versus assertiveness. And I think this is special for boys, right? Because they are usually physically stronger mm. and uh, maybe not able to regulate emotional uh, in a social setting, uh, mm. you know, uh, better. Um, they tend to go towards the aggressiveness uh, more than being as... That's what they want actually to be assertive, but I think they may fall into the aggressiveness, uh, both uh, physically and emotionally even, uh, mm -hmm. If they are not able to grow up with that kind of uh, balanced uh, emotional state, and that's mm -hmm. what rubber table play does. Because I realize that whenever I play my uh, mm -hmm. sons, uh, I remember. In fact, when my son, one of them was about, uh, I think below twelve, I maybe mean, we were so used to just playing physical, not like wrestling, eh? you know, like you know, physically, uh, you know, not punch but nudge each mm -hmm. other. That's one time that he nudged me. Eh? The pain lasted for a few years. <laughs> a few years yes wow. yes 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 it, it got wow. quite bad uh so i mean you know how then how rough i can play with my kids uh one of them because one of them was quite physical i mean he likes wow. until today he carry weights you know he like go cycling he like to he like sports uh generally wow. uh, uh and i think if if we try to uh uh control that too much you know and say that uh physical is no good uh then what do they do they may they may have coping mechanism. For example, uh, I think uh, Parkson can verify this correct. They may go into playing video games, right? Which is not physically uh, mm. uh, aggressive, but is, uh, you know, mentally aggressive. <laughs> mm. uh, you start, start mass murdering, you know, some of the games are like that. <laughs> yeah, the, the Fortnite and the Call, for, uh, Call of Duty or something, uh, Call of Duty. Uh, uh, right. Talking about killing, you know, uh, 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 people. Uh, so you don't physically kill people, but mentally you are killing a lot of people. <laughs> mm. so, so again, uh, if a boy resort to gaming more than physical play more, we must check 
whether mm -hmm. we are the one who are responsible not to give them the space and the time uh, to to form or for more physical play yeah mm -hmm. balance it all mm -hmm. So I'm thankful, uh, uh, Hafiz, after hearing your testimony, uh, I, I introduced badminton to my son. So we don't enjoy each other, but we still <laughs> expand that energy <laughs> on different courts, different sides of it. So I remember his uh, school, actually a boy's school, actually encourages you know, every boy to do two CCA, you know, one sports and one uniform. And so that is how they really uh, expand their energy and rather than, you know, because, you know, boys being boys, right, they have, a lot of all this uh, energy that they want to expand out. So I think that's one way. Uh, but for girls, I, I think uh, really one area, I think we talked about uh, what Parkson mentioned. I thought one area, key effective uh, teaching tool is also the, the modeling part. How we parents right, model at home. And, that, and this is how I think kids learn. Uh, you know? So for, for girls, I, I, you know, girls, uh, fathers and daughters always have that very unique, uh, special kind of relationship, right? And I, I thought uh, one, because this this uh, unique relationship, if you can seal it early, actually it will actually influence them in their future kind of relationships, you know? And I thought uh, one way is really to love our wives, to model it, and to demonstrate also that, that physical affection uh, and that communication part, the listening, uh, the acceptance, you know, and and uh, conflict management, yeah, and all this for 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 the daughters, uh, because I thought sometimes some of this affection assures our daughter, you know, in terms of uh, that she's always precious and worthy, and and I think that will set the right tone uh, for the future relationships she will develop, yeah, in the long run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's very good that you mentioned it because mm -hmm. uh, I have two daughters and I realized that. Uh, something not sensitive enough. Eh? Mm -hmm. uh, a, a daughter or a girl usually more sensitive towards uh, yeah. your comments on their body. Yeah. All right. Uh, how long their hair is, you know, whether they have uh, other physical, even talking about obesity and so on. Yeah. And I think it's important for us to be sensitive when they feedback, uh, they immediate feedback. Is that the, that's the true thing that they are feeling? Yeah. And if we just nudge it out as a man, no, 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 you shouldn't be so concerned about your looks. I think that is yeah. where the problem lies. We uh, putting our mind, <laughs> the boy mind, mm. into the girl's mm. mind. And the problem is, <laughs> if she doesn't accept it, and most of them would not, yeah. they will trick to other uh, modes or measures to reassure themselves, to that self, gain that self-esteem, self-confidence that they cannot get from the father or from Correct. the man. Correct. And I think this is also important when we are dealing with our girls. Uh, mm. They will one day uh, have, uh, I mean, they will develop uh, mm. biologically and emotionally and yeah. so on and uh, yeah. that also a bit uh, a relationship with other men or other other people other 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 men yeah. uh, and if we do not model according to your point uh, mm. the correct relationship of how mm. a man should treat a woman first mm. how we treat our wives at home second yeah. how we treat them as a girl yeah. so because I remember yeah. that I still hug my Two of my girls. One is in, one is twenty five. The one is fourteen. It's easier to have the fourteen than twenty five. <laughs> but I continue to have the twenty five, because I believe that mm. it must it, because of that she's used uh, to this thing about okay, this is how a man hug, and uh, it is uh, and I'm very particular not to uh, encroach into her private space mm. uh, because that's important for her to mm. know there's a boundary. I'm still mm. a father but I will not mm. encroach into that private space that you feel mm. uncomfortable. Because mm. out there, there are men who are not sensitive to, to this and mm. start taking advantage right, mm. of girls. And therefore, right. if the girl is not able to tell the difference and not used to that, right. then the effects would, may not be, um, uh, real, uh, what do you call it? Uh, be good, you know? The mm. outcome will not be good, yeah. Yeah. Wow, this is indeed a very lively conversation. <laughs> I hope, uh, Martin, you have enjoyed it as much as we have. Yes, uh, yes. Now, for the in closing, uh, mm -hmm. I know focus on the family is uh, it does a lot for families. And yeah. uh, Father's Day, Mother's Day just passed, so I'm sure yeah. you did something. Father's Day, yes. what, what's what's up for Father's Day? Anything planned? Yes, this year we're going to have a campaign called Stronger With Dads. You know, this pandemic, we need strong fathers, right? To lead a family out of this pandemic. So I think uh, the title of this year's campaign will be called Stronger With Dads. 
And uh, basically, I think this campaign aims to recognize and appreciate, you know, uh, fathers, you know, for their effort in stepping up to the care for the family, you know, amidst the, all the daily sacrifices. I think the, we aim to basically raise awareness of the needs and well-being of uh, fathers today, as well as to resource fathers, you know, with the tools to be the best dad and husbands they can be. So I think uh, fathers can head to, you know, this uh, our website at www.family.org.sg backslash stronger with dads and download all the resources to equip them you know this father's day campaign yeah all right so we will put the link in our comments uh descriptions of this uh podcast and the videos and our facebook page so please look out for it and do sign up for it okay stronger with that with that all yeah. right so, yeah so are you going to um Give them a COVID-19 vaccination on the spot when they enter. <laughs> <laughs> we have others vaccine. <laughs> this. Others vaccine, huh? okay, different kind of vaccine. Wow. Uh, vitamin F, is there such a thing? Vitamin <laughs> F. <laughs> yeah, probably uh, just to mention here, I think in every podcast episode, there's no end to talking about uh, about about the, the topic. But it's good, I think, for the listeners out there to go to our Facebook page and our Instagram where and our website where we share materials. Or even on uh, Center for Fathering website and even Focus of Family website, I think these are mm. websites and sources that, that fathers, if they are not nudged, they may not go to. All right? Mm. Uh, so I, we, are, we are telling fathers out there, there are resources mm. out there to help all of yeah. us to be better yeah. fathers. Please look out for them. And one thing is that we're also coming up with a rite of passage uh, program for, you know, fathers as well they can attend with their children because of uh, virtually you know and this will be coming up in december so we are planning for it uh, understanding you know the current time where we can't do a physical event like a day with that right we and uh adventure with that so we have this uh upcoming online uh, version that's in december 4th yeah so do look out for it as well yeah all yeah, right uh, martin wow. we'll be more promoting for you in december but there'll be yeah. a different rate already <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank yeah. you very much, Martin, for coming up to this uh, podcast. Yeah. Really appreciate. I was telling uh, Paxson, you're the best person to come up uh, to this no, uh, podcast. No, no, no. Uh, no, because you you have a father. Yes, a father. You have a daughter and son. Secondly, you are the relationship person in for yeah. focus of the family, <laughs> and the right person to tell fathers out there what are the right. uh, opportunities available for them to be better fathers. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thanks, Paxson. Thanks, Hafiz. Thank you. All right. Have yes. a nice Thank day, everyone. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye.